Episode 7 brings back fan favorites like Quintus and Gaius, but I also think this episode is an incredible illustration how, if we let it, fear can shut us down. But there is a solution. And prayer is the first step in getting the mind and the heart right. What did you think of Episode 7? Let's talk about it. Welcome to Durbania, I'm Durbin, and this is my spoiler talk review for The Chosen Season 2, Episode 7, Reckoning. And I love that title for this episode. Now, this episode doesn't build to a huge miracle or anything like that, but I think it has to deal with faith versus fear. How fear could get in and shut us down, but how faith gets us through even when it's difficult. And I think that's the reckoning. Yeah, we have that great scene where Jesus and Quintus finally meet for the first time, but I feel like the real reckoning in this episode is faith overcoming fear. So I'm excited to dive into this and talk about it. What did you think of The Chosen Season 2, Episode 7? Let's talk in the comments. Faith isn't my problem. You're all going to have to learn how to do this, regardless of what's happening, good or bad. Jesus said he will be back. Have you forgotten what they're doing to John? You can't just shut down when you're fearful. It was faith that delivered this man a miracle. Now that's more like... Quintus gives a fascinating analogy in this episode when Jesus and Quintus meet for the first time. He talks about eating raw fish, which I love sushi. They eat the flesh and spit out the bones. Faith is the meat. It's what we need to take in. It's what we need to consume. And fear is the bone. It's exactly what we need to spit out. And so we see fear's effects, how it can really shut us down in this episode. But we also see faith's effects and how faith can carry us through even some of the most difficult circumstances. And this episode does a really great job building up to those final moments, which is a better way to deal with fear. Prayer is the first step in getting the mind and the heart right. It's why you see me go to it so often. So teach us. In this episode, we really see Simon and Andrew switch roles. Because in the first season, you got Simon, who's the hothead, and Andrew, who is the voice of reason. It's Andrew who comes to Simon and tells him, Jesus is the Messiah. You're the one who told me he was the Messiah. Am I gonna have to be the one to remind you now? Now, in the last episode, they received word John the Baptist was arrested, and we saw that that affected Andrew deeply. But it's in this episode that we go even deeper into that, and we see just how much that has affected him and how fearful he's being. You know what they're doing to John. We can't let them do that. We Jesus. won't. The heart of Andrew's fear here is John the Baptist was arrested. He was arrested by Herod. He's in prison for life. This has taken Andrew's world and flipped it completely upside down. And here they are trying to build and prepare for this sermon, but now he's freaking out about unneeded attention being brought to them. Like at the end of the last episode where they were plucking the heads of grain on Sabbath, which is an oh no no. And then you have the Pharisees running out to confront Jesus and seeing this, they confront Jesus about this and Jesus claimed a, uh, a certain title. What reaches Jerusalem? that he claimed the title Son of Man and Lord of the Sabbath. That hunt them down, that put them away. It could completely ruin all the plans for the sermon. Yeah, so that freaks out Andrew even more. And he starts talking about using common sense and not drawing so much attention to ourselves. And Simon drops this line. Then let's not make a scene everywhere we go. That's all I'm saying. It's common sense. I think he's more of an uncommon sense guy. Get used to different, brother. Yeah, get used to different. Now for Laura and myself, one of the things that makes this picture so effective of like how fear could get in and just shut you down is when we think back to season one, Laura and I love Andrew's character in season one. If Jesus said, drop your net, he didn't just drop his net, he dropped it with gusto. He always had so much excitement. Whenever Jesus said to do something, he was incredibly excited to do it. So now that we see fear getting in and the attitude and what he's going through right now, this blame game that he's playing, like he talks about how Mary Magdalene having relapsed, they spent two days where they were and so they didn't have food, which made them hungry. Certainly will do anything selfish. Leaves the group stranded at camp for two days starving or puts Jesus on edge, makes him snap the Pharisees who are hunting us down now. That's the lens of fear. Hmm, bones. And so seeing how fear is getting in there and shutting him down like that, it's all the more effective when you just think about like 
how excited he was in season one just to do whatever Jesus said. Andrew, my little brother whom I love very much. What? I need you to take a very long deep breath. That moment as the Roman soldiers are walking beside the water and they're heading towards Jesus, it's well done. I mean, it really builds that intensity and I felt the tension in that moment. I mean, when we're looking at this from Simon and Andrew's perspective, they're out on the water on a boat. What could they possibly do about it? Like you kind of feel that helplessness with them. And Noah James did such a great job with his performance as Andrew in this. Like it was incredible what he did with this character. I can feel that stab of fear that he's feeling. He's already in a bad mood. He's already going through it. And now here are Roman soldiers heading straight to Jesus. It's like his worst case scenario confirmed. And it's almost like he didn't quite expect it even though he feared it. And now that he's seeing it, it's like, it's like something just breaks inside. Now, let's talk about the meat. Let's talk about faith. Don't be afraid. Tell everyone to keep planning. I'll be back. Here is Jesus the sinless man and this Roman soldiers approach him and he is preparing for this sermon that as he says is going to define their ministry and as he looks up at them it's just this calm collectedness comes over him and the face of this incredible difficulty and the face of this interruption he faces that with faith in fact he turns to his disciples and he says I'll be back and so he peacefully submits to being arrested that's flesh that's flesh I love seeing Gaius return. It, here's my favorite thing about seeing Gaius return. In season one, I loved the friendship between Gaius and Matthew. I love Gaius' line to Matthew's parents. There are some people that are mildly fond of your son. So when Jesus called Matthew and Matthew dropped everything and followed, I gotta tell you, I so wish Gaius did the same thing. Just so Gaius can be a disciple of Jesus right now. Just so we can continue that friendship and that team up of Matthew and Gaius. So it was very cool. We haven't seen Gaius since season one. And the first time we see Gaius in season two, Jesus says to him, Matthew's okay. Now this moment is also really interesting for me. You all look underfed. He's used to eating well. I love that. Like, even though he's kind of being threatening to Jesus and, you know, whatever, what I love is seeing that we haven't seen this guy since season one, but he is still concerned about Matthew. I thought that was such a great moment. And then he says this to Jesus. What do you have to offer him? Should we talk about this later? I just sense this fatherly concern that Gaius has for Matthew that Gaius wants to make sure that Matthew is taken care of. And I love how Jesus responded to that because I want Gaius and Jesus to sit down and actually have that conversation of what he actually has to offer Matthew and how much greater it is. I would love to have that conversation. I have a question for you though. What do you think they are building Gaius into? Like, who do you think they're building him into? I've seen a couple theories online. My theory is I think Gaius is gonna end up being the Roman soldier at the cross who says this truly is the son of God. Like, I think they're building to that and that's a great way to connect. I could be wrong. What do you think they're building towards with his character? Love to hear your theories about that in the comments. What happened? He stood there and did nothing while he was arrested. Once Jesus is taken into Roman custody, we have another opportunity here for flesh or bone, for faith or fear. And so when the disciples are all together talking about being about Jesus being arrested, there's a lot of fear that pops up in this moment. I mean, you have Andrew and everything that he's going through. He didn't ask you to help. He shouldn't have to. I don't recognize any of you. Brother, you're not yourself. He's not even himself anymore. His worst fear is confirmed. And to me, it's even sadder when it falls into the blame game with Mary Magdalene. Maybe I should come with you. I feel responsible. You might be responsible. Andrew, how could you leave? Stop this right now. And that kind 
kind of crushes me because she's been through so much in the last episode. And then as the emotions continue to rise a little bit later, you find some of the other disciples saying the same things to her. I think we should do what he said and wait here for him. Oh, yes, great advice coming from someone who disappeared for two days. How dare you? Don't talk to her like that. Oh. But it's this opportunity to take Jesus on what he said or not. Jesus said, I'll be back. Keep preparing. And so you have some of the disciples saying, those are his exact words. How could it be clear? He said he'll be back. So he will be back. But then you have other disciples like Simon Z who are saying things like this. Maybe it was a hint that we are supposed to be the fulfillment of those words. Zealots and your secret handshakes and quotes. And then you got Big James and John, the Sons of Thunder, and they're jumping on board with that. And then Mary reminds them of why they even got that nickname. You just interpreted plain speech about trust and peacefulness as code for insurrection. I think he's onto something. Hmm. Bones. And so here they are debating, what did Jesus mean by the words, I'll be back? When you go through the, uh, the Gospels, you see the disciples doing that quite often. Taking the things that Jesus said and going, what do you think he could have meant by this? Now, I'm agreeing with the disciples who said, this is incredibly simple. He said, I'll be back. So he will be back. It's amazing how fear gets in there and takes what is clear and muddies it up. And it's this great reminder that not everything in life is always clear, but Jesus has clearly given us his word. And so we need to take what he said and stand on it. So even when things aren't very clear, we do have what he's already promised and we can stand on that. It reminds me of when Later in the Gospels, the disciples are in the boat and there's this major storm. They think they're going to die and Jesus is asleep. What's he doing asleep? They're going to die. They wake him up They're like, Lord, we're going to die. Don't you even care? And he calms the wind and the waves and he turns and says, oh, you of little faith. So if Jesus is in the boat, then we could be calm because we could be assured of who he is. We could be assured he's bigger than the storm that we're facing. And so, yeah, we need to bring it to him, but we can bring it to him with thanksgiving and confidence instead of fear and doubt, knowing that he is so much bigger than the storms that we're going through. And I think a way we see that illustrated in this scene is through Mary Magdalene. I was wrong. I'm sorry, I relied on my own observation, my own understanding so heavily. Jesus said he will be back. That's flesh, that's flesh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I feel like even though Mary may not have got to this verse in her studies, it is now committed into her heart because she surrendered to Jesus completely in that last episode, coming to the realization that she needs him every minute of every day. She can't measure up. She can't do this in her own strength. It's exactly what she said in episode three. We can't be holy without him. That may have been head knowledge before, but it's heart knowledge now. And now she has that secure in her heart. So when Jesus says, I'll be back, she said it in this scene that she's not going to lean on her own understanding. She's going to lean on what he said. And so even though the disciples are kind of upset with her and they're showing that irritation with her that she was gone for those two days we see her like affected by that of course she would be affected by that but she's leaning on what jesus said and that's a powerful picture of faith it was faith that delivered this man a miracle now that's more like god did this i know her I'm another great faith moment is when andrew sees tamar and i love this scene because listen to what tamar says faith delivered this man a miracle. I absolutely love it because the way we got introduced to Tamar is when she brought that man who was paralyzed and she says, I know you can do this. And Jesus said to her, your faith is beautiful. And now here she is in that beautiful faith and she's declaring it openly, Jesus's power. And that's just incredible to see like the testimony she's giving for Jesus. Even though in that day and age, a woman's testimony was regarded as worthless, but she's standing there in faith and proclaiming the truth about Jesus's power and how faith delivered this man a miracle. So it was like gut-wrenching when Andrew's trying to silence her. You must stop drawing attention to Jesus. How can we not speak about what we have seen? How can you remain silent? The Romans? 
He's terrified of what happened to John the Baptist happening to Jesus and all this momentum that they've gained gone. And it's like even more scary because he's the Messiah. And as Andrew said earlier about the Messiah, with the Messiah, there's trouble, maybe even war. And so he's leaning on his own understanding and all of his own strength, trying to take care of this the best way he knows how. And I get that, but it's amazing how fear does that, how fear continues to muddy the waters. But it was incredible to see Tamar's beautiful faith put on display as she's proclaiming Jesus's power. And I do love how she ends up following Andrew and Philip back to the camp. I saw her in the trailer of season two and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I can't wait for her to return. And now she's here. So I'm really excited to see her interaction with Mary and Rama and the rest of the disciples and with Jesus. And you know, the man who was paralyzed and healed, like I hope they bring him back. You know, they're laying low right now. So I hope they bring him back anyway. Like it's just incredible to have these characters brought back. We finally meet. Here I am. I thought you'd be sort of taller, crazier looking. Ah. And then, of course, we get to the scene with Jesus and Quintus. And yes, it's a great scene. I love the first time we see Quintus in this episode. I come bearing intelligence. I bear ears. Good. I mean, that line is so hysterical. It just brings us right back into this character of Quintus and who he is. And we're just excited to have him back. And now we have this scene where Quintus and Jesus actually get to meet face to face. But you know what I love about this scene? It's just how calm and collected Jesus is. You seem to be splitting your time between creating headaches for Rome and victories we could not achieve ourselves. That's a little reductive. You know, something Jesus said, he said, I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what I see my father do. And I feel like in this scene, you see that. You see him 100% just resting in what the father says and what the father does. And so you just see him trusting in his father 100%. He knows he's gonna get out of there. He knows by nightfall, he'll be back with his disciples. And so he goes into this thing with this confident faith with this confident expectation of what his father is going to do. Do you see my problem? I don't know whether to eat you or spit you out. Stick to the fish metaphor. But we're probably past that now. I'm saying I don't know what to make of you. Honestly, I just love the back and forth of this scene where you have Quintus just being Quintus and you have Jesus just being Jesus. And I love as Quintus is trying to size him up to see, is this guy really a threat? I honestly... Go, Jesus of Nazareth, I like you. <laughs> and I love hysterical moments and hysterical lines like that. Like as Jesus ends this conversation. Don't make me kill you. I won't make you do anything. But my father on the other hand. I don't know what that means, but let's leave on a high note. But when Quintus brings up John the Baptist, I feel like that last and final dig is Quintus one more time saying, Jesus, don't be like your cousin. Don't be bones and don't make me spit you out. He knew what he was getting himself into. Do you? And I love Jesus' calm, collected response. It was a privilege to speak with you today, Quintus. Now that's flesh. That's flesh. Now I know this episode doesn't build up to some great big miracle or anything like that, but I love what it builds to in the final moments of this episode, the Lord's Prayer. And I don't just love it because Oh, this is the part in the show where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. No, I love it because it's so organic. It's so authentic how it's a response to what everybody was going through in this episode. And I love what Jesus says when he enters the camp about fear. I've already played this clip a couple times, but it's worth getting it stuck in our heads. We're all going to have to learn how to do this. Regardless of what's happening, good or bad, things are only going to get more difficult. You can't just shut down when you're fearful. And I love it because when they ask, teach us how to pray, Jesus is saying, I love it. Now you're acting like students. And I love how he walks them through that prayer. When we pray, we want to be sure to first start with acknowledging our Father in heaven and his greatness. 
And what's amazing about it is it really is true to how we need to respond to fear in our lives. I love what it says in Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, in reading that, I got to tell you, I'm still practicing it. Sometimes... I get worried about things and it just flies out of my mouth and I just speak the negativity over my life. And it's incredibly irritating when I do that. I'm not perfect, I'm growing. But what I do know is the more we do this, when worry, when fear comes into our mind and rather than dwelling on it, dwelling on the worst possible thing that could happen, instead, we take that and turn it into a request and we give it to God in thanksgiving knowing he is far bigger than it it changes our whole mindset. It's not about denying reality, but it's also about accepting the reality that God is bigger than anything that we can face. And so when fear and when those things present themselves to us, we could go through the Lord's Prayer and acknowledge our God is bigger than that. In Matthew 6, Jesus concludes talking about anxiety by saying, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. In other words, God knows exactly what we need. And when we seek him first, he's going to take care of us. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And one of my favorite parts about the very ending of this episode is when Jesus wakes up Matthew about the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, the time has come. Oh my gosh, I am so excited for the season finale of season two. Can you believe we're here? We don't yet know when it's gonna drop, but we do know that it's coming. So be sure to hit that subscribe button to become a Durbanian and hit that bell by the subscribe button so that you will be notified when my review for that season finale drops or my next movie review, ranking video, theological analysis, or anything else I do here. I'm Durbin, thanks for checking out Durbanian.